I'd like you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll be reading from verse 3 in a moment. We'll reread that. And when you think back to your, uh, your childhood days, and maybe some of you might even want to do this, uh, who usually wins at tic-tac-toe? Me. You know, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. And does he always insist on going first? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he, oh, okay, yeah. And uh, I, I generally, I think, uh, the guy that goes first in tic-tac-toe pretty well has the advantage, doesn't he? I mean, maybe you can, the cat can get the game a little bit, but yeah, that person. So uh, any of you ever been guilty of, me first? <laughs> yeah, we probably all have, haven't we? Me first. Uh, did you know, uh, how about checkers? Does the first move ever count much in checkers? You think that, that makes a difference? Not so much, okay. How about chess? Now you're, ready. now you're thinking, so, oh, so I got a little bit of affirmative there. Well, uh, anyway, just for your information, officially in the rules of checkers, black moves first, and in chess, it's white moves first. Now, we used to play house rules that it was always the youngest that got the move first move anyway. So anyway, uh, but anyway. In baseball, uh, in baseball, I remember uh, who gets, who gets uh, to bat first? What team goes first? You, you know what we used to do? We used to, uh, all right, maybe playground rules, you know, you'd, you'd throw the bat up and somebody catch it with one hand, remember? And then you'd go boom, 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 no tops. <laughs> and you've ever, oh, some of you know that kind of thing. And then the guy at the top, whatever, he, their team got to go first or choose first or, you know, that was how some things were decided in baseball. Even the pros, sometimes they flip a coin, don't they? Oh, it's tails. I don't know. Some of you guys are winners. Some of you guys are losers, right? <laughs> anyway, but, uh, you know, that, just things are determined in different ways. And uh, you ever been on the playground? It seemed like it took, uh, took about half the recess time to even get the teams chosen. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and uh, there were all sorts of things that were going on. And, but I, I, I remember it always worked best when, when, there were, uh, when you picked the two best guys you pick the two best guys to choose the teams, right? That way, that way, they weren't on the same team for number one. And, uh, and then, of course, then, then the, they, they seem to have a scheme in mind on how to win a game. They just, seem to have the, they just seem to have a plan in mind how to make sure the game was won, and so they would choose accordingly. They choose the best players, and of course, uh, you know, were you ever in that crowd, and you're saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Anybody like that? You know, trying to get noticed? Yeah. You, you definitely didn't want to be the last guy kicking your toe in the dirt, did you? You know, you never wanted to be that guy. But, uh, you know, sometimes I, I remember being on a team and being frustrated because uh, the person choosing the team just chose their friends and they didn't choose according to the best players. And, you know, that kind of an idea. And uh, because kids pretty much know once the team's chosen, they pretty much know who's going to win the game. Pretty much know once the, the teams are chosen how that's going to fall, fall together. Well, what is your first reaction when we read in Ephesians chapter 1 here that he chose us? What's your first reaction to that? Is it positive? Is it negative? Do you count it? Do you count it a blessing Remember, that's the context, context that we're in. He chose, he chose us, and it says here in this context that, that it's a part of our spiritual blessings. Don't you suppose he has a plan? Don't you suppose God has a plan as much as that, that kid who chooses his baseball team or whatever? And uh, let's read this context and let's just get a feel for the encouragement that we have in Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to start in verse 3 and read through verse 6, if you'd like to follow along. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, just as... And if, if you remember in Ephesians 1, 3, we spent, we spent the whole time last week emphasizing how this exalted God, how God was praised 
as the blessed God, the blessed one. So there's a, there's a great truth here when we're talking about blessed be the God. God is the blessed one. Picking up in verse 4 then, this blessed one, just as he, this blessed one, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And if you don't, if you don't come away from this passage encouraged, uh, man, you're missing something. We have the blessed God working to the praise of the glory of his grace, and we're wrapped up in the mix of everything. Are we going to answer all the questions that might pop into your mind here? Probably not. But we're going, to, we're going to be encouraged as we look at what the blessed one does and and uh, there's an encouragement out of this. There's an encouragement how to live. And so let's look at this context a little bit. But as we do, just remember every spiritual blessing. These blessings are from God, the blessed one. And these blessings are, because they're from God, because they're spiritual blessings, they are absolutely, irrevocably, unchangeably, and eternally ours. I, don't, I hope you never get tired of pondering that, that little statement. They're absolutely, irrevocably, unchangeably, and eternally ours. There is a sense of security and encouragement in thinking about our spiritual blessings that ought to just, whoo, it ought to just wow us. It ought to just encourage our hearts. So as Paul picks up in verse 4, he says, just as... Just as, in other words, he's explaining that these spiritual blessings that he has blessed us with, they're like this. They're like this. They are, they are, and he begins with, he chose us. Well, in the context, the he is God. God chose us. And, uh, you know, from the, from the context, it's, it's simple to see that God is, the, God is the one who acted here. And that's where my title comes from. My title, He First. You know, as we look back at verse 3 and we come into verse 4 and, and following here, it's about God first. And I think sometimes we get kind of wrapped up in our, so wrapped up in ourselves and we want to say, me first, me first, me first. We ought to especially coming out of passage like this where he begins, the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the blessed one. This blessed one, it's he first. And that's why I continued into verse six that it's to the praise of the glory of his grace. The focus is on God and, and we just get to go along for the ride. That's the focus and that's the context that we're coming from. The word chose. Comes just a, it's a simple word. It literally goes back to the root words are to speak out, to speak out. And so here's the guy. There's no doubt about the guy. He caught the bat. He gets to choose first. And he said, I want home run Hank. And then he gets down to the bottom and he says, I really don't want strikeout Slim. You take him. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you know the idea. I mean, there's no doubt. He speaks out. He speaks out. He makes his choice. And that's kind of the sense of this, that, that idea, God chose us. And I know questions fly across our mind, don't they? And for some of you who have studied a little deeper and that kind of thing, I know questions come across our mind when we encounter the verse like this. Well, if God chose us, how does this fit? Where do I fit in? Where does my choice come into the whole matter? And and, you know, we, questions about free will and questions about salvation, questions about evangelism, questions about, well, are we just robots then and that kind of thing? And uh, I, don't want you, I don't want you to get dwelling on the negative here. I want to encourage you. Here's the simple sentence. God, God chose us. That's the noun verb noun in the context here. And I want, I want you to walk away encouraged from this. This is a, this is a topic if you go back to if you go back to all of, all of uh, church history, 
and you look at the idea of, of uh, this question, it has not been settled in 2,000 years. The question hasn't been settled in 2,000 years. However, let me give you a simple point coming from an article that, was, that came out not too long ago, and it looked back to who made the initiative? Who initiated our salvation? And if you don't come away with God, then you're going to disagree with the councils of Carthage back in 418 or the council of Ephesus in 431 or Orange in 529. The bottom line is that, is that of these councils is that God was the initiator. God made the first move. And I have to agree, we, even without digging in digging into all the details, I have to agree that God initiated, initiated really all things. You know, I've known some folks who have run so far and so fast, maybe I should put that the other way around. They've run so fast from God choosing, they've run so fast from that, they've actually embraced open theism, which says God doesn't know everything that's gonna happen. What a puny God. What a puny God. That God wouldn't know. That God is not omniscient. I tell you, we need to hold God so high and recognize who God is and exalt Him like we've been singing about. That our God not only knows everything. Well, in this context, it says God chose. God made a choice. I've had other friends who ran so far, well, I guess God is an omniscient, he just, he just saves, he's going to save everyone in the end. Brethren, there's a lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20 where those who don't trust Jesus Christ are going to end up. And so, and so I'm not going to run, I'm going to embrace what God has to say here and say, and see, God chose and the, the emphasis is that is he first, not me first. The emphasis is that he made the first initiative. And you know what? When I get down to the bottom line, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. And probably nobody can explain everything and all the questions that come up. But maybe we don't have to. Maybe we don't have to explain it. Now, I could give you pages upon pages or whatever, but I would, I'd like you to turn back to Romans chapter 8 with me briefly. Romans chapter, actually Romans 11, excuse me. Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> and I'd like you to just look at the end of Romans 11. And uh, this is in a, a context about, about Israel and, and the branches broken off and all things that go on, etc., but I love how he ends, how he ends the chapter in uh, verse, let's start in verse 33. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it should be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. You really know the mind of God? Remember the old uh, quote in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9 where it says, His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts? I'm glad I have a God who's way up there. And that I can't answer every question about him. And so I'm just going to come back to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to, I'm going to accept what, it's, what it says here. And recognize there's a sense of security and a sense of motivation. And I hope you see that today. A sense of security and a sense of motivation. When we exalt God to this high place and recognize, okay, he chose us. And notice it says before the foundation of the world, he chose us before creation. Before he even created. That's a symbol for eternity if you're not aware. It's a little fancy. 
But the sense is that he did this before he even began the creation process. He chose us. Wow, does that just blow your mind? Is that way beyond our understanding? You better believe it. Before he even began to create, he chose us. He had us in mind and he chose us. Our blessed God is eternal. Not only is he omniscient, he's also eternal. And he does, and he was acting in eternity past. And uh, the implication is that, is that uh, with this timing, if this is before time, it had to be for any action on our part. It had to be beyond any merit on our part. Just like it was in Romans chapter 9 when he compares Jacob and Esau, where he, he loved Jacob and, and, uh, and hated Esau in that context of Roman 9, Romans 9. But it says it's before they did anything. God chose. It's He first. And it's to the praise of His glory. And if, and if our minds don't adjust to that, then there's something wrong with our thinking. It's to the praise of His glory. Now, in our, human, in our human frailty, I'll just ask you the question. How many of you can tell me the exact day you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Go ahead, raise your hand. No, I, I didn't mean to scare you. Go ahead. Can you, none of, some of, yeah, some of you can't. Yeah, good. You can remember the exact day. You remember, I remember the exact day. I, don't, I can't remember the date, but I remember the exact time and setting and whatever for me. So in our human experience... In our human experience, we say, yeah, it was January 12th, 19, whatever, you know, that we trusted Jesus Christ as, a, as our Savior. But this context says, before that, before he even made you, before, you know, he, God chose us. Wow. Even before he created us. Somewhere along the line, God's choosing and our trusting mesh. They come together. But I want to warn you about putting human experience in front of God's Word. We, we have trouble with that in other areas. We've got to be careful with it in this area. What are we going to embrace? God's Word or human experience? Which puts He first? Which one exalts Him? Which one puts Him first? Notice what goes on in the verse. He said, before he created the world, that, the, that we would be holy and blameless. Holy and blameless before him. Do you realize that right now we stand? Right now we stand holy and blameless before God. We've had some discussions in the last few weeks about our standing versus our state. We have this position and our practice. Our position is that we are holy and unblameable before Him. Our standing is that we are holy and unblameable before Him because of the work of Christ. Because of the work of Christ, we stand right now in this holy state. That's why you can call us saints using that word. And then in the future, we will stand before Him holy and unblameable. In other words, once you trust Jesus Christ, once your faith is in Him because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, you have a holy and a blameless standing before Him that is absolute, irrevocable, unchangeable, and eternally ours. We have, that's ours. That's the way we stand. And it's, it's now and it's forever. We'll stand before Him because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Implied here is the idea that if left to ourselves, we'd never do it. That's why I think God has to be the initiator. God has to be the first mover in the whole thing. Romans chapter 3 and verse 11 says, none seek God. Left to ourselves, none of us would. If we're honest with ourselves, if we just kind of let things go in our lives, we'd never choose God. We'd never choose Him even though we know Him. Oftentimes we kind of let things slide, don't we? And we move away from Him. We need to focus that He is first. It's for the praise of His glory. I think of Israel in their context, in their setting, when Israel um, 
when Israel, oh, after, you know, in Jesus' day, let's pick up. In Jesus' day, Israel had this arrogance about them, didn't they? They had an arrogance about them that, yeah, God, we're God's chosen people and we're the seed of Abraham and we're, you know, that was all their brag. It seemed to be that's what Jesus was battling over and over and over. They had this haughty attitude because they were the chosen nation. That's not what God desires of us today to say when we see, oh, God chose us. Oh, well, it must have been something great. In no. It's a humility in it. It ought to provoke a humility in us that we could not, we cannot. God had to reach out and save us. And it's He first, and it's to the praise of His glory. Blessed be God. He chose us. Going on to verse 5. You might notice when I read this in the Scripture, I tried to tie the phrase in love from verse 4 to verse 5. I don't know if you noticed that or not. I tried to do that. The end of verse, verse 4 says, in love. I think the phrase in love ought to just be ought to just be connected. You know, it wasn't until the 1500s that we even had verse divisions in the Bible. So, so this in love, I think, fits best with this idea of predestination. And so God, in, in love, He predestined. In love, God predestined. The word predestined is kind of an interesting word. It, it comes from two words. And uh, the first one is pro, meaning before. That's the prefix. And then orizo, where we get our word horizon, horizon. And the sense of horizon, what's the horizon? Well, if you look out, you see where the land meets the sky. It's that line that marks the difference between the two. If you ever, if you remember how, how children paint, how do children paint the sky? Right up at the top of the page, right? And it never touches the, never touches the earth. I mean, that's, you know, I understand that. But they still have a line, don't they? They still have a place. Well, the horizon is that line, that line where, where, the, where the land and the sky meet, that kind of an idea. And it's, the, it's that which is marked out. When you, turn, when you look at this Greek word here, marked out beforehand, chosen beforehand, determined beforehand, ordained beforehand, that's the sense of this word. That God, and notice, Notice as you go back to the verse here how it says, in love having predestined us. Having predestined, in other words, God, God had a plan, God marked out a plan. And you know what's interesting? If, you've, uh, if, you've, if you think about this word in the context here, you should be able to see it, but this actually happened before the choosing happened. Having predestined. In love, having so God had a plan. I think of the I think of that ball player. He's choosing his team. You know, he wants home run Hank, right? And uh, so he's choosing his team according to the plan that he has in his mind. I need that good hitter. I need that good fielder. I need you know. God has that plan in mind, and and the sense is he had the plan first, and then he acted upon it. He planned and he chose. And that's kind of the sense of this idea of predestined. Our loving God. He acted in love. The eternal, omniscient, blessed, creator God predestined us. Wow. If you stop and think that God Almighty had a plan in eternity and in the scope of things, he chose you. He, he had a plan that included you. That ought to throw you to your socks. That ought to encourage you. God had a plan for me. Hmm, God still has a plan for you if he predestined and chose you. God has a plan. He has a design. And in this context, it says he chose us. He chose us. I'm going to get back to the verse here to adoption of sons by Jesus Christ. He, he chose us, he, had, he predestined us, excuse me, to ad the adoption of sons. The idea of adoption is literally the word sonship. And uh, I, had a, uh, I had a picture up there. I did, can you go back and find my picture up there, Jessica? We're, we're breaking in Jessica there a little bit. 
There, Paul's writing to the Ephesians. Here's a picture of me at Ephesus a few weeks ago in the small theater. I'm in the blue there. I'm reading scripture in that, in that passage in, uh, in that small theater in Ephesus. But I, the reason I put that up there is because, because the hundreds of people that would sit there or the thousands of people that lived in Ephesus, the thousands that would fill the big, the big theater in Ephesus, they would have an idea what this adoption means that would be very different, that would be very different from what we think of the word adoption. And that's why I put in this context here, this, in Paul's day, these Ephesians, the people that had sat in these seats, they would understand that it included, that adoption includes putting your own son into the family. They would understood, understand that. And so let's give us the rest of it there, please. They would understand that it meant that you would take your son at about 14 and you'd gather around. This is the, this is the toga virilis. This, there was a ceremony when you would invite the family together and the child would be 14. In a, sense, in a sense, they probably didn't have a very good relationship even with the father in those younger years. They were often sent off, you know, maybe often left with a, a caregiver and that kind of thing. But when they came of age and they considered about 14, interesting timing there, they would have this ceremony and the men of the family would gather around. And in this ceremony, the, the, the child would take off his childhood type clothes. He'd take off that outside robe of childhood, cast it aside, and the, the men of the family would give him this robe of maturity, this robe of a mature son. And it would signify in this ceremony there would be speeches and there would be direction to tell him that he had, he had rights and privileges and, and he was now a citizen of the community and he could buy and sell. And he, in other words, he had made this step into life. God says the moment you trust Jesus Christ, you have been blessed with every single spiritual blessing like having been predestined to be a mature son. And as I've been pondering this idea of being a mature a mature individual in the, in the context here, I think sometimes, sometimes we think in terms of, oh, they're a new Christian, they're immature, and we kind of we let things slide. You know, there isn't this idea of childhood in the Christian life. Now, from this, from this standpoint of adoption, there isn't that idea. Have you ever seen... Have you ever seen someone that's a new Christian and they're, they're on fire for God and they just, wow, they just wow you with, with their dedication and whatever? What happens to us along the way sometimes? I think we lose sight of the whole picture. I think sometimes we, we think that maybe we can do it on our own. But in the context of the idea of, a, of maturity, the moment, the moment we trust Jesus Christ, we're placed as a mature son and God expects us to live that way. We, should, we, we shouldn't have the attitude, well, I don't know very much, I don't, you know. There's this sense, there's this sense from this word that, that we, we ought to have that attitude of trusting the Lord every step along the way placing ourselves in his hands. And really, you know why the new Christian sometimes just thrives for a while? It's because that's what he's doing. He not only trusted Christ, he's allowing the, the, the Lord to work in him. And we need to have that same thing, no matter what, how long we've been saved, allow the Lord to work in and through us to empower us to actually accomplish what we can't do on our own. Because number one, you cannot live the Christian life on your own. You cannot. And religions around the world, Christian religions around the world, think you can. And most Christians probably think they can. But I think that's what this is saying here. It's, it's challenging you. You've been placed as a mature adult in Christ now, are you going to depend on 
on God to empower you, to live up to who you, who you are? I think that's kind of the goal behind this. It's all about he first. He first. <coughs> Nothing to do about me first. I like the context where this word adoption is used. There's the idea of, there's the idea of, of relationship. Sonship and relationship is tied together in this context here. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, the idea of adoption and the idea of Abba Father. This is an endearing, endearing term that, that we have a relationship once we have this adoption. A relationship that cries out to, to the Father in a very dear and sweet way. And he says, it's all through Christ. It is the cross that makes it possible. It is the cross that accomplishes it. Through Christ. The moment you trust him, that moment you are his son. The very moment you trust Jesus Christ, that moment you are his son. And notice, notice what the, how the verse ends, verse 5. To himself. To himself. Wait a minute, I thought this sonship was about me. No. It's he first. He predestined. He chose. Along the way, we get to be sons. Along the way... We get eternal life. Christ, Christ accomplished all this on the cross. But it's to himself. To the praise of his glory. You know what? The implication is, is that if, we, if this was left to ourselves, how would it ever be accomplished? Let me just give you a prime example from Genesis. Adam and Eve. I don't think they were in the garden more than a day. That's my theory. And they blew it. How well do you think you would go? How long do you think you could accomplish? What would you... Now, the emphasis is that we need a dependence on Him. And it's all according to the good pleasure of His will. Ultimately, it's about Him. He first. And we just to get to go along for the ride. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who predestined us. God chose his team according to his plan. And you know what? We're going to win, right? We're going to win. We're on the winning team. Doesn't that encourage you to grab your bat and go out there swinging? Get on it. God chose you. God predestined you. God has a plan. You're part of the team. Grab the bat and go, man. To the praise of the glory of His grace, He first. <clears throat>